Today we're talking about the end of the world and how the idea of the end of the world shaped church history. Welcome back to Church History Podcast. I'm your host, Loralee Siemens. Today, I'm talking about a man who is hated. As I researched for this episode, I was surprised that this man is so hated. There are even people who say that he was satanic. I'm going to tell you his story in just a little bit, and then see if you can understand why people hated him so much. But before we can jump into the story of this man, we have to start by looking at how the idea of the end of the world has shaped church history. We need to remember that God has used the Bible to teach every generation. Today, we stand on the shoulders of great men and women who went before us. In season one of this podcast, we talked about the apostles and the writing of the Bible. We talked about each book in the New Testament and why it was written. I also talk about this in my book, The Church is Born. The book of Thessalonians was written to reinforce Paul's teaching on the end times and to talk about some of the questions they had about prophecy. Chapter 4 explains one of their main problems that they had. They were confused about what was going to happen to the believers who died before Jesus came back. You see, the Christians had come to believe that only those who were living when Jesus returned would be eligible for God's kingdom. Those who died before his second coming would miss out on everything. But Paul wrote this to help them. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of the men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangels, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, We, who are still alive and are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. In the year 140, The Shepherd of Hermas was written. This was one of the most important books written during this time period. And in this book, he writes about the church escaping the tribulation. Here's what he wrote. You have escaped from great tribulation on account of your faith, and because you did not doubt in the presence of such a beast. Go, therefore, and tell the elect of the Lord his mighty deeds, and say to them that this beast is a type of the great tribulation that is coming. If then ye prepare yourselves and repent with all your heart and turn to the Lord, it will be possible for you to escape it. We could see here that in this very early church document, that the church already believed there was a time of tribulation coming and that they needed to be prepared and repent so that they would escape it. When Constantine came to power, there was a fight between Alexandria and Arius. We talked about this in four different episodes at the very start of this podcast in season one. Arius was trying to get back into the church and he convinced Constantine that Constantine was the one God had chosen to bring in the kingdom. The church had been living under extreme persecution, and suddenly there was a ruler who claimed Christ and who was giving Christians roles in the government. Arius' followers believed they were entering the kingdom age and that they had just lived through the tribulation. In the 4th century, there was a man named Cedo Ephraim. He was a theologian, and he preached a sermon called On the Last Times, the Antichrist and the End of the World. Right from the very start, we can see from the title of his sermon that he believed when the world ended, there would be an antichrist. Here is what he spoke in this sermon. We ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is imminent of overhanging. Why, therefore, do we reject every care of earthly actions and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
so that he may draw us from the confusion which overwhelms all the world. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation which is to come, and we are taken to the Lord in order that they may not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sin. So you can hear in this message, he is speaking about the church being gathered together and taken away so that they're not here when the tribulation comes. I'm going to leave a link to this entire message in the show notes so you can read the whole thing. And then there was Augustine. Rome was falling and people blamed the church. Augustine wrote a book called The City of God. And in this book, he wrote that history was divided into two cities, the city of God and the city of those who rejected God. Augustine taught what is called amillennialism. He actually started this teaching. It literally means no thousand years. Augustine didn't believe in a literal thousand year reign. He believed it was symbolic. Augustine didn't believe in a rapture, a tribulation, or an earthly millennium. He wrote that the kingdom of God was the church. And at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD, Augustine's view was taken as accepted view. When Mohammed began to wage war in the church, some in the church believed he was Antichrist and the end of the world was coming. The Catholic Church embraced the teachings that God was ruling the world now and he was ruling through the church, specifically through the Pope. They didn't believe in a literal kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom, and the Pope was the one ruling. As the year 1000 comes close, the church believed Jesus was going to return and was going to be angry to find Jerusalem in the hands of Islam. They began to travel to Jerusalem to prepare for Jesus' return. You can kind of think of like teenagers who were left home for a long time and found out their parents were coming home soon and were trying to quickly clean up the house. They wanted to prepare Jerusalem for Jesus' return. This idea eventually led to the First Crusade. Now, the Crusade was, of course, far more complicated than just this. But this was just one reason that started the movement. We did a bunch of episodes on the Crusades where I go into more detail about them. In the year 1260, Brother Dolissimo, who led the Brethren Movement in Italy, taught about the end of the world. In his biography, the historians of that day wrote this. He believed that Christians were going to be transferred into paradise without death in order to escape the persecution coming from the Antichrist. The word he used was the same word used to describe Enoch being taken to heaven without death. He also taught that the Antichrist would be killed, and then Brother Dolissimo would return to preach the gospel to the survivors. So to sum it up, he believed there would be a rapture, then years with the Antichrist ruling the world, and then the saints would return. There is many other writers that taught this same thing. John Bale in the 1500s wrote the first commentary on the book of Revelation called The Image of Both Churches. And in this commentary, he talked about a rapture. Joseph Mead came shortly after John Bale, and he was a strong premillennial. He was a professor of Greek at Cambridge, and he wrote about the rapture in the year 1627. A man named Peter preached about a secret rapture, a time of tribulation and Jesus returning to judge the nations in the 1600s. In the 1700s, two men named Philip Doddridge and John Gill actually used the word rapture and said that it was coming at any minute and we needed to be prepared. Thomas Scott taught that the church should be caught up to God in the air in order to be kept safe from the tribulation. John Askill wrote that people might not die and may instead be raptured. He taught this even though the church persecuted him for this teaching. In fact, because he taught this, he was put in prison where he stayed for 30 years and eventually died in prison because of this belief. And then there was Morgan Edwards. In case you're wondering who Morgan Edwards is, he founded Brown University. And here's what historians write about what Morgan Edwards taught. He taught the distance between the first and second resurrection will be around maybe a thousand years, somewhat more because the dead saints will be raised and the living changed when they meet Christ in the air. And this will be about three and a half years before the millennium, as we shall see hereafter. But will they just abide in the air the whole time? No, they will ascend to paradise or to some of those many mansions in the Father's house and disappear 
during the foresaid period of time. The design of this retreat and disappearing will be to judge the risen and changed saints, for now the time of the judgment must begin, and that will be at the house of God. Another event previous to the millennium will be the appearing of the Son of Man in the clouds, coming to raise the dead saints and change the living and catch them up to himself, and then withdraw with them as observed before. The event will come to pass when Antichrist be arrived at Jerusalem in his conquest of the world, and about three years and a half before his killing of the witnesses, an assumption of Godhead. The Antichrist claimed to be God and deserving of worship. The last event, and the event that will usher in the millennium, will be the coming of Christ from paradise to earth, with all the saints that he had taken up about three and a half years before, to justify against the accusers of the brethren, and to settle their future business and reward. Millions and millions of saints will have been on the earth, from the days of the first Adam to the coming of the second Adam, and all these Christ will bring with them. The place where they will alight is the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. So we could see here that Morgan Edwards talked about the rapture, an antichrist demanding worship and claiming to be God, and then the church returning with Christ to defeat the antichrist. We can see that from the start of the church all the way until the 1800s, there are many examples of the church teaching about the end of the world. And many of these teachings talked about a rapture, the Antichrist, and Jesus returning again after the rapture and tribulation to set up a thousand-year kingdom. When our character was born for this story, people were talking about the end of the world once again. In 1789, the French Revolution had begun, and people began to wonder if the tribulation was about to start. On March 3rd, 1801, in Westminster, A girl named Anna gave birth to her sixth son. John and Annie Darby were landowners, and this put them into the upper class. They came from a well-known family and had connections with other really well-known people. John's brother was an admiral named Henry Darby, who was well-respected for his battle wins. John and Annie named their son after his father, John, and gave him the middle name of their family friend, Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson was one of the most respected admirals in the Navy. So this little baby, John Nelson Darby, was born into a respected home and family. When he was old enough to go to school, he was sent to the best schools. He attended Westminster and Trinity College, and he was an excellent student and graduated with high honors. During his time at school, he embraced Christianity for himself as a personal decision. He was studying to be a lawyer but he felt that God wanted him to serve full time. While at Trinity College, he studied under a man named Joseph Singer, who encouraged him on his spiritual journey. In April of 1816, a volcano erupted on a remote island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, Mount Tambora. The eruption sent volcano ash into the sky and blackened the globe. The sunlight was blocked. Europe and North America had dark skies, and spring stopped, and winter returned. The crops failed, famine spread across the globe, the sky was permanently dark, and people began to think the world was ending. Depression spread through the country along with famine and disease. Ireland, France, England, and the United States all lost their summer. It was one full year of winter. It was that summer that sent Thomas Jefferson into a debt that he never recovered from. While he was in debt before this summer, it was this debt that made his debt become unmanageable. It was during this winter that never ended that a young Mary Shelley wrote the story of Frankenstein. Between the wars and the disease and the darkened skies and the failure to have a summer, people all believed the world was coming to an end. And it was during this time that Darby was in school. It was his formable years. After school, Darby joined the Anglican Church and was ordained. In 1825, he became a deacon, and then he went on to be a priest in the Ireland Church. During his time as a priest in Ireland Church, Darby gained a large following. He made it his mission to convince people to leave the Catholic Church. Although he had come from a well-to-do family, 
He spent his time in ministry dealing with peasants. He loved them, and he made it his mission to reach them with the gospel, and his church grew by hundreds. Then everything changed. Politics became part of the church. I have to pause here to explain what was happening in politics. Around 30 years earlier from this point, the king had began to show mental health failure. He prorogued the parliament for a month. He was suicidal, and some thought he was not fit to be the king. When he reopened parliament, he wasn't able to give a speech from the throne that he was supposed to give. The problem was parliament was not allowed to start debate until the king gave his speech, so the country came to a halt, as no business could be done in parliament. This opened a debate. Should the prince take control, or should parliament just choose the next leader? William Pitt argued for control of parliament instead of the prince. If you remember, we talked about William Pitt in the episode on William Wilberforce. William Pitt was his best friend from college who was in parliament with him and became the youngest prime minister of England. This argument continued for months, and in February, King George recovered and opened parliament with a speech. In 1810, 15 years before Darby became a deacon, the king's mental health crashed again. His daughter, Princess Amelia, died, and he fell into despair. Once again, Parliament argued about how to deal with this issue. After two years of constant debate about what to do, it appeared the king was not going to recover. He had gone mad. The Prince of Wales took on the role of king, and that way Parliament could do their job. This was also the time that Napoleon was fighting with Russia, Prussia, Austria, and Britain. In 1820, the king died, and his son, George IV, came to the power at the age of 57. Let me describe this king to you. He was extremely obese, and most historians believe he was probably addicted to drugs. His wife, Caroline, had lived in a separate castle, and both had relationships with other people. Caroline tried to become the queen, but King George IV refused to allow her to have the title. He tried to get a divorce, and he ended up annulling the marriages to make sure she had no right to the title of queen. And she died suddenly, in July of 1821. She told people around her that she believed she had been poisoned just before she died. George spent what today would be $22 million for his party to be crowned king. Why do I tell you all of that? Well, it was clear he was not someone who should be running the country, let alone running a church. However, the Church of Ireland said all priests must support the king and swear allegiance to him as a rightful king of Ireland. John Darby was not okay with that. He spent time cultivating a relationship with the peasants. He could not tell them he supported this fat, partier, overindulgent, lazy, self-obsessed man. How could he look at the poorest people and tell them he supported this king and then tell them about Jesus? It just didn't make sense. And he refused to do it and he walked away from the church. In 1827, John was in a horrific horse riding accident and he almost died. He was forced to move in with his sister so she could take care of him while he recovered. Forced to be in bed for weeks, he spent his time studying the Bible. He had to find out what he truly believed. If the Church of Ireland could be so wrong about the king, what else could they be wrong about? And it was during this time he began to study the idea of the kingdom of God. He was in a fight with the church about the king on the earthly throne, and that made him want to study more about the kingdom of God. What did it look like? He spent time in the Old Testament and reading old church writings, he began to see that what he had been taught about the kingdom of God was not a belief that he accepted. John slowly healed over time, and he began to meet with other men who wanted the church to be separate from the government. They also believed the Holy Spirit could speak through any Christian, not just the ones ordained. The group met together to study the Bible and have communion. The group grew and took on the name Plymouth Brethren. In England, one of the men attending this meeting was George Mueller, who we talked about in our last two episodes. In 1831, John officially left the Church of Ireland. Imagine with me it's 1833. 
You are a Bible student and you are attending a conference organized by Lady Power Scrout. You are enjoying your time with other Bible students and you're about to hear a lecture from a man named John Nelson Darby. You settle in your seat and then hear a sermon that blows your mind. Mr. Darby teaches that God is going to call his church home, that suddenly the entire church was going to be in heaven. No death. The rapture. The world would then fall into chaos, following a man led by Satan for seven years. Jesus would return with the church after seven years for one final battle with Satan. And then Jesus would rule as king here on earth for 1,000 years. During the seven years that Mr. Darby called the tribulation, God would use the Jewish people to spread his message. You don't know it, but you just heard a message that was a turning point in church history. John Nelson Darby taught what he had discovered in biblical teachings and in ancient writings. He wrote what is called the premillennial pre-tribulation rapture teaching. While there were church leaders who had taught and wrote about this in the past, John Nelson Darby became passionate about this teaching, and he wanted to make sure the regular man and woman in the pew could understand this teaching. He believed it would give them the hope that they desperately needed. Today, most of the critics of John Darby are strong Calvinists. However, Darby himself was a Calvinist and defended the Calvinist teachings. Here's one of the things that he wrote. For my own part, I soberly think Article 17 to be as wise, perhaps I might say the wisest and best condensed human statement of the view it contains that I am acquainted with. I am fully content to take in it literal and grammatical sense. I believe that predestination to life is the eternal purpose of God, by which, before the foundation of the world were laid, he firmly decreed by his counsel secret to us to deliver from curse and destruction those who he had chosen in Christ out of the human race, and to bring them through Christ as vessels made to honor to eternal salvation. Darby gave people a way to articulate, to put into words, what many of the people at the time believed, and he used a word, dispensation. The word described the idea that God dealt with people differently through time. Here are the dispensations. One, innocence. How God dealt with Adam and Eve in the garden. Conscience. The time after the garden and before the flood. Human government. The time between the flood and the Tower of Babel. Promise. The time of Abraham until Moses. Law. The time of the law given to Moses until the cross. Church, the time from the cross until the rapture. And the seven years of tribulation. The kingdom, the 1,000 years of Jesus literally on the earth reigning. What Darby explained is that the kingdom was taught in the Old Testament, but that the time of the church had been kept a secret. That it was as if God paused the clock of time to make sure all the world had a chance to find grace. We can see in the first three stages, God dealt with a whole world. But from the time of Abraham until the cross, God dealt with the Jewish people. Now, in the age of church, God was once again dealing with a whole world. But the promises God gave to the nation of Israel were still to be fulfilled. And after the rapture of the church, the pause would end, and God would be dealing with the nation of Israel once again. It's pretty clear when you read the Bible that God does deal with humans differently through time. We as the church do not follow the laws of the Old Testament, and the people who lived before the time of Moses also didn't follow those laws because they hadn't been given yet. Darby didn't invent this theology, but he gave us a word to describe it, and he named the different stages in the Bible. At the time, the idea that God was not finished with the nation of Israel seemed impossible. We talked about the nation of Israel in our episodes on the Crusades, and we're going to do an episode in the future on the nation of Israel and work our way through church history again, looking simply at the nation of Israel. But it was during this time that there was a group of people who were advocating for the Jewish people to once again be given control of Israeli land. 
John Darby began to travel and preach his teachings on the church, Israel, and end times. He also taught the assurance of salvation. He would give altar calls at the end of his sermons and call people to repentance right now at this very moment. You could leave this service with the assurance of your salvation. And this was a new way of preaching, and this idea was embraced by the evangelists traveling and preaching and was part of the revival services at this time. The Brethren Group divided in 1848 and formed two different groups. John Darby became the most influential leader in what became known as the Exclusive Brethren. John did most of his teachings in New England and Ontario. He translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek and into many different languages and books that he wrote. In 1882, Darby passed away in England. A year after he died, a group of men met in Niagara for a Bible conference. In attendance was W.E. Blackstone, Charles Edmund, James H. Brooks, William Moorhead, A.J. Garden, A.C. Dixon, C.I. Schofield, and J. Hudson Taylor. We did an episode on J. Hudson Taylor, and he was the one who founded China Inland Missions. In this meeting, these men came up with strategies for new missionary movements. They wanted to create more Bible conferences and created a plan to start more Bible institutes and Bible colleges. They also talked about the ideas Darby had been preaching about, and they agreed with his teachings on end times with a rapture, followed by a tribulation, and then a literal thousand years kingdom. They also talked about dispensationalism. This conference is seen by many as the birth of the modern evangelical movement. One of the men present was Schofield, who wrote the Schofield Reference Bible that teaches dispensationalism, rapture, tribulation, kingdom, timeline. So why do people hate John Darby? Well, the accusation is that Darby invented the idea of the rapture. And that's why I started this episode the way that I did. The idea of the church being taken up to meet Jesus in order to escape the wrath of God and the persecution of the Antichrist was written by many people before John Darby. He was one of the most influential people of his time. And this was during a time that ended slavery, birthed the modern missionary movement. Instead of trying to change the culture of a country to be more British, the missionaries would embrace the culture of that country that they were ministering in. This was also the start of the church preaching that you could have assurance of your salvation today at this moment. You could leave a church building with the knowledge you were a child of God. This change led to revivals that spread through the 1800s. His influence led to the starting of Christian universities and schools. He was also a huge influence in the idea of keeping the government out of the church. And his teachings led to the Schofield Bible that spread the teachings of dispensationalism and made the pre-tribulation rapture and literal kingdom age more popular and easier to understand. But he didn't invent the idea. Now, if you hate the evangelical movement, then I guess you probably should hate John Darby because his teachings birthed that movement. But to say he was satanic or that he invented the teachings is simply not true. Here's a shocking idea. You could disagree with the teachings and the beliefs of a person and still respect them as a man or woman of God. When we look at the life of John Darby, we see a man who truly loved God and wanted to please him. If you throw out the idea of the rapture because you believe it came from John Darby, do you also throw out everything else that he taught? Or do you throw out everything else the church was embracing at this point in history? This was when the church began to teach that slavery was opposed to the Bible. And since we don't have a lot of church followers before this time period writing in opposition to slavery, should we say as a church that slavery is not wrong? How about the idea of missionaries not forcing Western culture on countries that they were working in? This came during this time period with Hudson Taylor, who was friends with John Darby. The teachings of the rapture didn't start at this time period, but the embrace of the teachings by the Western church, especially in Canada and America, did start and became very popular through the life of John Darby. So that is the life of John Darby. Next week, I'm going to be back with another story from this time period. The 1800s are so rich with amazing stories of church history.
In the meantime, if you want to hear more podcasts or you want to watch some videos that I have or read some blogs, you can check out my website, lauraleesiemens.com, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>